Welcome to the Analytics Engineering Podcast, featuring conversations with practitioners inventing the future of analytics engineering. On this episode, we sit down with Wes McKinney, the CTO of Voltron Data, and best known as the creator of Pandas. This episode was intimidating for me, so thank you to my coworkers, Anders and Cody, for helping me prep. Not only am I not a data scientist, but Wes's work is really prolific, from Pandas to Arrow, Ibis, Velox, Parquet, and more. We cover a lot of ground, but spend the majority of the time talking about why creating language-independent open memory standards might change our industry as we know it. With Wes's help, I see a lot more interoperable components coming to the data ecosystem. I think that in this episode, you get to hear both of us <laughs> try not to engage in too much. Maybe hero worship is strong, but like Wes is a really widely known innovator in this space, and I've got a tremendous amount of respect for him. So it was just neat for me to have the opportunity to get a piece of his brain for a little while. I think the thing that really, you know, this is towards the end of the episode, but the idea that tabular calculations could lead to custom silicon, do analytics people get our own TPUs eventually? That's a really neat idea. And, and it's like one of these discontinuities that doesn't come around that often. And Wes didn't claim that it's going to come around tomorrow. But it's neat that there are projects that are still driving us towards these like very significant discontinuities. Yeah. What really stood out to me was Wes is extraordinary prolific, but he can also go so, so deep. And so this conversation is definitely more technical than some of our other episodes. And it helped really demystify some of the nuts and bolts of what's happening in our computers behind the data work that we do. So it was a really fun episode for me. So without further ado, let's get into it. Wes, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I started learning Python in, I think it was like mid-2015. And I had written Ruby and eh, some different languages, but this is my first time learning an imperative programming language that was focused on data. And the class that I took, and it was some like MOOC, was it included Pandas. It was just like by default a part of the curriculum. So even back in 2015, you were already Wes McKinney, the creator of Pandas. <laughs> it was like you had to say the whole thing together. When did that happen? When did you go from being a grad student to like this person that lots and lots of people had heard of before? It all happened uh, pretty quickly. I mean, I started building the library that became, that became Pandas back in 2008. And uh, it was a closed source closed source project at that time. Hmm. And uh, I got permission. I was working for a hedge fund, AQR back then. And, you know, long story short, I got permission to open source it, which was unusual in those days uh, for anyone in the fin any financial firms to open source code was pretty unusual. But, you know, I made a, I made the case that it would be good for the company. And I think maybe, you know, part of it was just getting me to shut up about it and get back <laughs> to doing my, get back to doing my job. But you know, Panda 0.1 uh, got pushed out to PyPI on New Year's Eve 2009. Oh, wow. And nice. it, sort of, it sort of sat there for a while. So there wasn't like, you know, a stampede of people like, oh my gosh, data analysis, Python, just what I've been waiting for. Which is kind of never what happens, right? Like, no. <laughs> it always starts out, no one really cares about this thing that you did. Yeah, so, so there was a few things. So firstly, there was um, a lack of awareness um, that, you know, people didn't know that there was this this thing out there. And so, um, but but there was also still a lot of essential functionality missing. So I went to my first PyCon in February 2010 in Atlanta and gave a talk about using Python in quantitative finance. And so that was like my first foray into the Python community and first like, you know, appearance, I guess. Um, and I went to, I went to SciPy in, in Austin that year. And so I started making like the conference circuit because I was going to, you know, going on the conference circuit because I wanted to meet, I wanted to meet other people in the field to get mentor, mentorship from other open source developers. And just to, yeah, to, to, um, I think that statistics and data analysis and the kinds of problems that Panda solves were not we're not exactly Python's bread and butter at the time. And so a lot of, there were a lot of like folks in the Python developer community at the time that were 
a little bit disinterested in in um, kind of the kinds of things that I was I was working on. So it was a little bit of a socialization effort to make people aware that there was an opportunity to make Python relevant for this new uh, like emerging field of data science, and that, that Python could have a have a chance of being an important language for uh, for for doing that. Um, but it wasn't until, indeed, as you point out, like I, I started a, a PhD in, in the middle of 2010 and I saw that there was not, I, I just felt like this compulsion. I felt like there was this, just this need to, um, add a bunch of essential functionality to pandas and make it into a tool that could, could enable, be like a, an accelerant for the adoption of Python for what we now call, what we now call data science. And that was in 2011. And so I took a one-year sabbatical, self-funded sabbatical uh, from grad school and I moved to New York because I felt that, you know, being in New York was like just that was where like there was a lot of energy and, and data science at that time. Um, and so I started engaging with like the, the data community there in New York, which was very inspiring to me. I got connected with like ad tech companies like AppNexus um, at the time. And so that, that exposed me to a lot of new use cases and helped me like get, have more, develop more breadth in terms of the capabilities of the Pandas project. I would say by like middle, like, like middle 2012, by the time, um, like I just finished, uh, writing my, I just finished writing my book and had spent like a year writing blog posts and going to conferences and, and really just like putting a lot of essentially developer relations content out there that, um, you know, the project started to, to, to pick up some steam and, and uh, really, I think having, having my, uh, my book out there, Python for data analysis, which came out, uh, I think the, it was first available in October, 2012. This is O'Reilly. Yeah, it was with O'Reilly. And yeah. so then there, then there was a resource for learning to not, you know, learning to use Python pandas from a, you know, from like a data, like what we would now call a data science, uh, data science perspective. So if you go back to 2008, you made, I think you'd have to educate me on this, but I think what was a reasonably non-consensus bet on using Python as the language that you started to build in, wouldn't the default answer at the time been something proprietary like SAS or maybe R? I mean, it, was this around the time that Hadley Wickham was building the tidyverse? That's a long story. Well, Okay, it's sure. Tr it's, tr it's true. It's true. It's <laughs> true that in 2008, the I think the consensus choice would have been uh, the consensus choice would have been R. Okay, um, R, R or MATLAB. And I I had a lot of colleagues at the time that used they used both languages, and I felt that I felt that there was like something there was something lacking in terms of like usability as a usability as a general purpose programming language and building mm. and building software. So certainly like MATLAB was kind of a, like kind of a non-starter, like you could build software in MATLAB, but like calling it software and like something you could like build and deploy, there was a whole like licensing issue. And, yeah. and it was like, it was just a whole quagmire of licensing and other, not to mention that it's just MATLAB, it really isn't designed for software development. I think R you know, had as a, as a general purpose programming language, like it's Turing complete, like it's, it is a real programming language. It's built, it's basically a Lisp internally. But still, in my opinion, like it just didn't really fit my mind. And, and mm. I found like I was, I felt like I was like blowing my toes off trying to build software at I, in R. It's true that at that time, like Hadley, Hadley was active, like ggplot2 mm. existed and plier and some of like the precursors to the, to the tidyverse. So a lot of the like kind of principal key ideas of the tidyverse existed at that time. The pipe didn't exist, but you had the idea of the pipe existed in, in ggplot2. But, uh, I think the tidy, the modern tidyverse dplyr and, and kind of the whole smorgasbord of, of the tidyverse didn't start coming around until 2014, 2015. So choosing Python was a, it was a contrarian choice, but I felt so much joy, like writing code and, yeah. and building and building, you know, kind of rinky dink software applications in Python that, um, you know, it, it felt like a, a bet worth making to try to, to build, uh, you know, moderately capable suite of data manipulation tools that at least would make my own work a little bit less tedious than, than it, I felt it was at the time. Sure. I think what's interesting, I think what's most interesting about, about pandas that, that often like, I think the origin story is really interesting, but 
what a lot of people know is that I, I started a company in, in 2013 and I suddenly became like too busy to uh, maintain a large and growing open source project. Yeah. And so I essentially like had to hand off pandas in 2013 to yeah. like a, like a different group of developers. And so I think like without people like Jeffrey back, like taking the reins of the project and really building an active developer community and like sustaining, yeah, millions of users, I think the project would be way less successful than it is now. So I feel like maybe I was like, you know, the yang to the yin, but like without that community of like really passionate maintainers, like the group of maintainers was only maybe like a half dozen people for, for many years. Totally. But I think the project would have been, uh, would have been way, way less successful because I feel like I, I kind of abandoned it in 2013 because I got too busy with other stuff. The topic of open source maintenance and like passing the baton, I think is so interesting, but in order to even get there, you have to do some stuff that you decided that you were interested in doing that I think most folks who kind of build a thing and publish it on GitHub don't do. You actually went and you wrote the book, you went to the conferences, you did all this actual promotional work. And I have the experience of of doing that stuff too. But I think that most people aren't actually that interested in that, or maybe they don't know how to do it. What kind of fueled you in those, I don't know, four-ish years and before kind of this thing took off? Like what, what do you think that made you able to kind of navigate that dark forest? It's true that it, it is, it, it can be, it can be pretty painful, uh, <laughs> and, you know, particularly like, I mean, as you know, anyone who's contrarian or isn't, is doing something that isn't, isn't mainstream, like you feel like you see something that other people don't see, or you see a potential that is, could be realized like with a certain amount of effort or like a certain amount of buy-in from other people. But like, you just want to convince people to see the world or see, like, see the, the world of possibilities in the way that you do. And so I, I, you know, I, I felt there was the, this, this significant opportunity and like, I saw, you know, like a better, <laughs> a better future, essentially, you know, world more free from MATLAB, I guess, or, <laughs> you know, a world with more choices. So I, I think that that idea to like, really, you know, you have an idea, like you see, you see an opportunity to convince people to believe in, you know, what you see, what you believe in. Um, that like that desire to evangelize and and uh, spread new ideas, uh, I think to me at the time was really, you know, was was really compelling. I mean, I think I've been uh, engaged in projects of that nature essentially my my whole career. It's like figure out what's missing or like what's wrong with the status quo and identify big problems or like a new way of looking at things and then convincing other people to uh, finding birds of a feather people to you know join the you know, you're, uh, you're marching to, you know, you're marching to music that only you can hear. And eventually, you know, you find that other people can hear the music too. And pretty soon you've got a party. So I like that. It's a fun process, although it can be, it can be difficult, you know, when it's just you dancing alone in the room by yourself. <laughs> so it sounds like you were able to get Pandas zero to one feels not quite right. You probably got it a little further than zero to one, but you got it off the ground. And since then, there's been like a lot of enthusiasm around the ecosystem for Pandas. And you wrote this kind of interesting article not that long ago, the, the 10 things I hate about Pandas, which was surprising, I think, to see from a creator of the original project. But I think one of the things that we've seen happen over the course of the life of Pandas is that it works extraordinarily well when you have data sets that are of a certain size that can be loaded up on a single machine and fits nicely in your RAM. But it has some challenges, as Python does as a language, when you need to scale beyond. And so there's been this activity in the ecosystem around using the Pandas API, but using a different kind of compute engine on the back end, either Dask or Spark or Ray to some extent as well, to really supercharge Pandas at scale. What has happened to Pandas in the more recent years? And there seems to just be this wealth of interest. Is it because there's just a lot more work to do? Or, or why do you think that we continue to see all these projects crop up? It's true that, that Pandas does struggle with, with, large, with very large data sets, data sets that don't fit on your computer or don't fit into, don't fit into memory. And I think that the, you know, the article, the article that you referenced, like the 10 things I hate about pandas, if it goes back to like a, you know, a talk that I gave almost, you know, maybe nine, eight or nine years ago. Um, I think what's, what's most interesting about what's most interesting about pandas is the, is the user experience, like the kind of the API design and like the, it's kind of the philosophical approach to building, like building its interface and like what it feels like to use 
to use pandas, like the feeling of like immediacy, like the feeling of like, you know, just, you know, you have the data and you feel like you, 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 you develop enough of an understanding of the library and uh, you feel like you can do anything. And so you can be super productive and you can like, you know, do all kinds of data cleaning and, and, and data manipulation really, uh, really easily. Um, but as a, as a computational project, um, and like the internals, like the internals of pandas had, um, you, you know, have, have some issues that, that prevent, um, have made it difficult to, to make the project, um, you know, seamlessly scale to, to deal with larger data sets or to be significantly, be significantly faster. And I would sum that up was like, you know, sum that up as described the problem as like pandas wasn't. Uh, built by somebody who understood databases. And so, you know, in the, me in the meantime, you know, we've had new projects emerge like, like DuckDB, which provide, you know, a scalable, you know, ultra fast, uh, local database that runs, you know, anywhere you want it to run. That was built by real database people, um, you know, that, uh, you know, completely, you know, completely blows, you know, um, the, the backend, you know, implementation of pandas out of the water. Um, but as you point out, like people really love the, the pandas user interface. And so there have been these efforts like, uh, you know, like Modin and Koalas, um, and, uh, you know, and DAS data frames to provide, you know, essentially some subset of the, you know, emulate, emulate pandas to a certain extent. And, and the projects have, str have strived to emulate pandas to do a different extent. So I think that you know, projects like, like Modin and Qualys have, have gone for more of like, we want this to be a drop and replacement, like just change the import statement at the top of the file. And you're off to the races with the code that you've already written that uses pandas locally. Um, whereas DAS data frame, I think adopts like some of the API conventions of pandas, but is leaned a little bit more into exposing like some of the distributed like logic of, of, of DAS and like, you know, you can control like partitioning and other, other features of, of how the data set is distributed on a cluster and it gives you more access to the way that DAS works. Um, and that's important, you know, for being able to, yeah, essentially to have more control over how the, how the computation runs. A lot of the innovation is really borrowing from the interface that everyone loves with Pandas, but making it more scalable so that it works on data sets larger than what can fit on a single machine. And it's fascinating. You, you bring up DuckDB. We had Jordan on the show last season, and it seems like small data sets are making a comeback in some way where it's like, how big do you actually need your query engine to scale if your data set can fit on a singular machine, if your compute is powerful enough, if you have enough memory, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think what's what's interesting, well, I'll get back to the topic of the data frame APIs, but I think what's interesting about projects like DuckDB is that it's 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 changing the definition of what small data is. I think like I think traditionally small data is data that fits in in RAM, like in your, you know, I got like, you know, 32 gigs of RAM on my MacBook Pro. So like if your data is like 10 gigabytes, maybe that's small data. If you're working with DuckDB, like suddenly 100 gigabytes of small data because it fits on your fits on your laptop, and you know DuckDB is can uh, can run run its queries, you know, in a very small memory footprint. So suddenly, you know, what you thought of as like medium sized data is now small data, mm -hmm. and uh, that's very interesting. But I think what one of the things that's really pushing the 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 pandas emulation is is because there are so many pandas users, and so. Um, there's this captive audience of, of people around the world who have built skills using, using the pandas project. And so if we can equip these, this audience with the ability to work, do scale out, you know, scale out computing, working with massive data sets without having to learn a new project or like, you know, they can, their skills are fully, fully portable. I think that's super, that's super powerful. Do you have any kind of an estimate of how many pandas users there are? I mean, millions? No idea. I'd say there's millions. Like maybe uh, it's hard to estimate because we don't have telemetry, but yeah. maybe like, you know, my guess would be like five to 10 million, something mm -hmm. like wow. that. So it's a lot. But I think what's the, the I think the, the challenge has been like the, I think that the, you can emulate pandas well um, for, you know, 90% of cases, something like that. Uh, but if you have a large enough code base, you know, it's like, you know, you flip a coin, you flip a loaded coin uh, enough times, it's eventually going to come up tails. And so 
I think it's it's very very difficult for a long list list of reasons to build a you know scalable you know pandas uh, kind of pandas emulation layer um, that can be a full drop in replacement. So I think yeah. you you get something that's good enough for writing new code, and you just know like okay, here's like list of X Y Z pandas features that you can't use with this with this library. Um, but uh, but if you're going for like you know, oh, I'm a corporate customer with, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code that use pandas. And when somebody comes in and says, oh, you should switch over to use. It's just very, very hard to rip out and replace because people are yeah. comfortable. We could talk about this a very long, sure. the yeah, full, the full episode because yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> but I actually want to bring us into the current, which is your, the project that I think is devoting most of your attention to these days, which is Arrow, amongst others, you have a very long resume of projects that you've contributed that have impact and is used pretty widely. But one that I'm really excited about is Arrow, which is part of the focus of your newest company, Ultron Data. Maybe tell us a little bit about what is Arrow and what is the promise of the technology? So in 2015, partly in response to the thinking, spending a couple of years thinking about, you know, how can we build a better computational foundation for uh, for data frames, um, I became exposed to the to the big data big data world and found that plugging the data science ecosystem into the big data stacks and things like Apache Spark and you know database systems more generally things in the Hadoop ecosystem uh, was extremely difficult. Um, and so uh, we started. Um, I started poking around the open source ecosystem and found that there were a lot of other developers who were thinking about how to make data systems more modular and composable. And we realized that a problem that we could solve that would make the problem a lot easier, make this problem of composability and modularity a lot easier, is if we had a universal um, language independent um, data standard for tabular data. Um, and so that was the initial, you know, purpose of the Apache Arrow project was to develop a universal column oriented data standard that could be used portably across data engines, programming languages. And so that solved some immediate, like serious pain, like need to like move a large data set, like in process between C++ and Java, like we can do that now. Um, so that solved like some pretty critical, like low level systems interoperability challenges. But the Arrow project has, you know, over the last six years has, 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 ex has blossomed into this, um, you know, um, kind of multi-language like toolbox of of libraries for building analytical computing systems. So we've developed, we developed a data format and then we built like protocols for serializing and transporting that, that data format. Um, we built a framework for building high performance, uh, network services, data services, microservices that transport, uh, tabular analytical data sets. We're building, you know, standards and protocols for databases to build, build in native support. For uh, for the arrow arrow data format, um, and more recently, we're also you know building and supporting the development of um, modern um, computing engines that are native to the arrow format, and so that's given way to um, things like um, that's given ways to things like data fusion uh, in Rust, uh, Acero, and C plus hmm. plus, and uh, arrow compatible databases and query engines like DuckDB and Velox from led by Meta. I want to play it back to you to make sure for those that are less familiar with Arrow and are just getting caught up to speed. So it's a columnar memory format where it makes it easier for different languages to have transport data and read and understand in memory the same like lower level systems information. So one of the one of the pieces of the project is the is what we call the Arrow columnar format, which is a, you know, language independent memory format for for data frames and and tabular data so it gives you the you know it's how you how you arrange the data in memory for for processing it's like how it fits in your computer's ram you could also put it on disk and and load it into memory without having to do any conversions or conversions or deserialization which is a very helpful feature in building systems and so if we just built the the format, but we didn't build libraries to do anything with it. Um, so like a lot of the development work that's happened has been building like libraries and components across a wide variety of languages to make it easier for developers to build um, arrow enabled systems. 
Julia, I know why you're drilling in on this. I had my own. So West, to be totally transparent, when Arrow first came out, I read about it. I read like everything I could find about it. And I was like, I don't understand what the hell this thing is. And, and you used similar words then that you're using today. And I know that when you talk to somebody like my co-founder, Drew, it like makes complete sense. I'm a database person and I like don't think in file formats or on disk or in memory file formats. And so Drew frequently has to translate computer science concepts to me so that I actually like understand what the hell people are talking about. And I had this big aha moment where you're talking about cross language. Okay. So you build a system in C++ and you build another system in Java. And my guess is in 2015, when you're talking about the Hadoop ecosystem, like there is a lot of multi like you're trying to integrate different systems that are in different languages. And those two languages can't actually share memory space. I, I see you nodding. Am I at least roughly correct? I mean, <laughs> directionally, right. <laughs> I mean, you can, you know, you, you can share in many cases, you could share like a memory address. Like you could tell like across, if it's in process, you could tell, maybe you connect like Java to C++ or you connect like, I don't know, um, like Python to, you know, Python to C or Python to R um, or Python to Java. And so you could pass, you could pass a memory address over the boundary and say, hey, hey here's my data. But then the question is, well, what's the data? And so, but in, to, so traditionally, you know, the different environments, you'd have a different you know, memory format and like the way that the, what the, the way that the data is arranged that that memory address is different. So there's no way, when no way to read it in, you'd have to write a converter. So you'd have to, and uh, so you'd have to like run a convert, conversion function to convert. Yeah. And okay. it's expensive. Yeah. Did people often communicate between these different systems by just like writing the data out to disk and then reading it from disk? They, they would, or they might use something like um, they might they might define an intermediate binary format for mm. moving the data between systems. Like uh, they might use protocol buffers or Thrift, mm. or there's there's you know there's different tools that have been created for you know moving data across the network or moving data from you know from process to process. And so that but that requires that requires conversions like a conversion overhead as well. And the classic example is like when you run a SQL query against a database, the database sends the results of that query back to you, um, but it has to send the data back to you in some kind of format. And so typically that's, you know, um, that's called like the wire protocol of the database. So like Postgres, like Postgres has its own wire protocol and MySQL has its own wire protocol. So another simple question I have to ask, because so it sounds like there's all these different formats uh, or languages that Arrow is compatible with. And there's like a long list now. I'm reading from a list that I've gathered, but it's C, C++, Java, JavaScript, Go, Python, Rust, Ruby, and so on. There's probably more that I've missed. Why does it matter as much? Like if most data work is done in Python, SQL, Scala, why does it matter that JavaScript can now read from this memory format? Well, it comes down to speed, efficiency, and and latency in in applications. And so, you know, for example, like there's there just to use the JavaScript example. Um, so there's a number of um, there's a number of uh, projects that have adopted adopted Arrow as the um, the interchange format for connecting their you know web app front end to um, to the back end, which might use Python or hmm. Java or Rust or something else. Hmm. And so you end up, so basically you can, you can send data from the back end of your application to your front end. And there's effectively zero, like zero overhead hmm. aside from actually relocating, you know, the, the network, network speed. And so you don't have like that extra, like, hit of overhead of like, okay, I received the data from the back end. Now I have to convert it to this, you know, whatever data format I use in my, in my front end application in JavaScript. And so, you know, so we've seen like, you know, pretty, um, like, uh, like Streamlit was one example of, uh, of a project, uh, Streamlit's now, now a part of Snowflake. And, you know, they built this, this, uh, you know, framework for building, you know, like, uh, you know, rapid, you know, machine learning applications in, in Python. And so there was a lot of like data communication between the front end and the back end. And they had like a bunch of custom code that they used for dealing with the conversions between the front end and the back end. 
And so when they adopted Arrow, not only did they make things like significantly faster, um, like there's, you know, you can look up the article and it was like, I don't know the exact number offhand, like 10 X faster, but they were also able to like delete all of this custom code that they wrote. Mm. And so it's like things get faster. You get to delete a bunch of custom code. Fascinating. It's a, it's a win-win. You mentioned network latency. There's a couple main components to like why stuff is slow, like why data work is slow. I think there are two big ones. You tell me if there's other big categories, but like there's disk access, reading and writing from disk. And, and maybe important in this context is like converting between memory formats, but then there's network access. And so let's say that you take the earlier two categories and you like zero them out. They're like gone. You still have to fight with the network, right? And then you're fighting with the laws of physics. So if Arrow is taking a big chunk out of this other section of things, is that most of the time spent in most data applications or is it only a small percentage? It can be a big part. And like, there's definitely, you've heard, we've seen reports that people talk about like sometimes, you know, 80% of a data application could be spent in, in serialization, like converting between, you know, converting between memory formats. Um, but also like there's, um, I mean, nowadays, like particularly, um, with like the way that, that modern, um, like processors like GPUs and CPUs are, are developing, um, like the, the way that you arrange the, arrange the data to be processed makes, uh, can make a huge, um, you know, can the, like if you arrange the data in- incorrectly, um, it can make the processor like a lot less, a lot less efficient. And so, um, so like modern CPUs, like the, um, column oriented data, like you can, you, you can use, um, you know, SIMD instructions, which are, it stands for single instruction, multiple, multiple data. So they're kind of processor intrinsics that allow the processor to process multiple values with a single, a single CPU cycle. And so like, as time has gone on, like the, the, the number of values that can be processed by, with a single intrinsic instruction has, has increased up to 512 bits at a time where traditionally, you know, CPUs, you know, could do 64, 64 bits. They could only deal with like one, you know, 64, four bit value at a time, you know, per CPU cycle. And so like arranging, so essentially arranging the data um, to maximize throughput, like th- the throughput for the processor, not only like the ability to process values, like using these vector instructions, but also, um, but also like such that you're, you're taking advantage of the processor's cache hierarchy. Cause now like, you know, modern CPU is not just like a processor that like, you know, runs x86 code or runs ARM instructions. It's like also there's like these three layers of L1, L2, L3 cache. And so you have to think about like when you're designing the processing engine for your data system, like you have to, as the system developer, you have to design around how data is going to flow between these different levels of caches. That can make orders of, that it can make, you know, 10 to 100 times difference in performance if you're using, um, if you're using the processor, uh, the processor effectively. Of course, nowadays, like a lot of the computing, even though Moore's law for CPUs has slowed down, processor processing um, efficiency is still getting faster in in GPUs. So, like a lot of just the innovation and in, uh, processing power and the ability to process like mass quantities of numeric data or analytical data, you know, is not happening in CPUs as much anymore. It's happening in it's happening in GPUs and FPGAs and even custom custom silicon, and so. I think that, that, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of the kind of the next, you know, the next generation or the next frontier for analytical data processing systems, uh, is going to happen in, you know, similar to like what's happened with like cryptocurrency mining, it's kind of a dumb example, but like, you know, it started out on running on CPUs and then it was, you know, GPUs and then FPGAs and now it's all, now it's all custom silicon. But, uh, you know, if there's, opportunities to, uh, to leverage, um, you know, to leverage GPUs, um, and, uh, you know, and kind of other like accelerated computing technologies to process, do, you need know, to run SQL queries and do analytics faster. Um, there's a will, there's a way. I mean, the amount of, I, I don't, I don't know if you've contemplated like the amount of money that's being spent globally on running, um, running analytics workloads or doing machine learning, but it's pretty, probably pretty insane if we actually could get the number or like maybe, yeah. 
I want to read you a quote from a fan, which suggests this future that you sound very excited about. And I want to maybe make it more tangible for folks. This comes from George Frazier. He wrote a post on Hacker News, which got a lot of attention. He said, Arrow is the most important thing happening in the data ecosystem right now. As Arrow spreads across the ecosystem, users are going to start discovering that they can store data in one system and query it in another at full speed. And it's going to be amazing. So, I mean, that's pretty high praise. We talked a little bit about like this, like multi-language support for the same data memory format and why that's exciting. What is the crazy out there dream with me view of if Arrow becomes adopted everywhere and people can like read from the same format, how is our world going to change? It's hard. It's hard to extrapolate maybe, you know, and, you know, 10 years from here, but I think the, I think the main like things that, that I'm really excited about and that, you know, one of the reasons why we've got this company, this company, Voltron Data, is that, you know, we're really investing in, in making the different, the different layers of the modern, you know, analytical system stack, um, you know, more modular, composable and, and polyglot. And Mm. so I think like to have ultra high performance, scalable language integrated querying capabilities um, whether it's querying for, you know, for analytics or feature engineering for machine learning pre-processing and to have like essentially to, you know, because ultimately what we want is for, you know, to align the interests of software developers and hardware developers so we can have the hardware developers working to um, develop the analytical computing primitives to do run the internal details of SQL queries and you know, feature engineering machine for machine learning as power efficiently as possible so that we're emitting less carbon, you know, to run these, you know, run these computing workloads. Um, but then on the user side, we have the freedom of choice when it comes to programming languages. So we have high quality, um, kind of, you know, high quality, natural feeling programming interfaces, APIs, whether it's in Python or in Rust or Java or Go or, you know, Julia, I mean, who knows what'll be the most popular programming language for data science in 10 years. But, you know, the the hope is that it doesn't matter. Like you can pick the language that makes sense for the kinds of applications that you're developing and your different system integration needs and your ability to your ability to process large amounts of data and get that data at high speed into your application is not inhibited by your choice of programming language. That idea that there's a conversation happening between the application developers and hardware developers is a really normal thought inside of ML. There's yes. been this very, very tight feedback cycle now down to, you know, TPUs and Tesla has their own, wh- whatever. But my understanding is that databases or like tabular data has, even though it's a massive set of workloads, has not had this kind of custom silicon work done for it. Is that true or do I just not know about it? No, it, it hasn't. I mean, I think one of the reasons is that the the algorithms themselves are pretty, you know, are pretty complicated. I think, you know, some of the some of the things you do in analytics, like hash tables and like some of the, you know, some of the things involved with like joins and aggregations are, I'm not a hardware design person. So my intuition is that I think designing custom chips, like for doing some of those things is, you know, is more, more difficult in some ways than, than tensor operations. But to your to your point, like I think the the synergistic relationship between hardware hardware development, like what you've seen happen with TPUs, and you know power efficiency for running, you know training deep neural nets, like you know with PyTorch or with TensorFlow, and uh, I think that's 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 kind of the the exact model of like what I'm talking about, where um, you know e- you want like a you know programming interface which la- enables you to build your models. And then, um, if, uh, you know, um, you know, hardware gets better under the hood, or if there's like a, you know, hardware can accelerate some part of the, you know, some part of the workload, um, you know, you can use TPUs and, in, in um, you know, Google cloud without needing to know anything about TPUs. You just need to know how to use TensorFlow. Um, I'm not sure what the state of like, uh, kind of, you know, accelerators for, uh, for PyTorch torches, but I'm sure that there's like a lot going on there and. Um, in some ways, like I think it, it makes things easier for uh, for the hardware developers because they're they say, okay, well, what are what do the developers want to do? They want to do PyTorch or they want to do TensorFlow, so we're gonna 
you know, we're going to uh, work with the PyTorch community to make sure there's a well-defined, you know, interface between the hardware and the PyTorch runtime so we can expose our hardware to PyTorch users without um, it being intrusive to them. And so I think that's, that's, that's totally like the, you know, what, you know, kind of like, like, you know, the goal, I think for the whole computing ecosystem is to, um, you know, have more, um, you know, unification at the, at yeah. the API level so that like the details of like, you know, the scale of the data and, um, the type of hardware being used is not, um, not something that the users have to think, think too much about. And I think that that, that vision has been uh, significantly more realized in the machine learning community, but it's not, not, not yet, uh, you know, not yet something that's possible and that's something that's, that's widely available and, um, more like the, you know, analytics, I guess. So it seems like a lot of your work has really been to push that mission forward of like reusable, composable, having these like building blocks for the whole data analytics world. We figured it out. Wes is an API guy. He loves yeah. designing APIs. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. There's like probably a half a dozen other projects we didn't touch on, but Bellox, which is another project you're contributing to, is a collection of high performance reusable data processing components. And it's used in query engines like Presto and in Spark. I guess without going into Veloc specifically, I'm curious if you feel at all like too much choice could be not necessarily better. Is there a point where we can get down to the components where they become actually challenging for the users at hand? For a lot of the projects that we're that, that you know that we're involved with, you know, my, my you know myself and, and my and my company Voltron Data. So you know Veloc, you mentioned uh, another project, Substrate which, uh, you know, it provides like an kind of intermediate language for talking to talking to computing engines like like Velox, for example, they're not these are not user these are not user facing software mm -hmm. components. So like the user isn't going to be sitting there thinking, like, ah, should I, should I use Velox or DuckDB to, you know, to to uh, to run this, you know, run this workload. Um, well, I think what, what we want is for the is, is for the the front end layer, kind of the user user layer, user face layer. To, to make those decisions on on behalf hmm. of the user and to make intelligent decisions on the basis of like what you know available knowledge about what the user user is doing because I think the goal is to deliver good performance good you know good computing efficiency and to you know be less bothered with particular details of like what you know what computing engine is being used so I think a perfect example of this at uh, Microsoft uh, they they've uh, been um, working on a research project called Magpie. Um, where they built a data frame API using um, the IBIS project, which we heavily contribute to, um, and that what they they trained a random forest model, which um, based on the characteristics of the data sets that you're working with, it will automatically select which um, cloud SQL backend within the Azure cloud to use to run the workload um, based on the characteristics of the data. And so, um, so that's totally kind of like what we're going for. So then the user isn't thinking like, oh, do I use like Synapse or Cloud SQL Server? Like the framework will just decide for you based on what it, it thinks will deliver better, you know, bang for your buck. Yeah, I buy that. So complexity is okay as long as you have sufficiently more power. And these are machines that we're talking about, which can handle it versus users, which yeah. have a hard time keeping track of all the pieces. Yeah. I'm going to move to our wrap up question we asked this of all our guests but looking 10 years out what do you hope will be true for the data industry i hope that it will be less less fragmented and in some ways perhaps like less competitive than i think there will always be there will always be competition uh of course um but i think there the, the users are faced with 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 a lot of you know a lot of choice and the like i think the amount of different choices of different technologies that they could use for different different pieces of the stack do create a lot of, a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And then there are knock on issues with the, the choice of like what components you choose because some, some systems work well together and some, some don't work well together at all. And so one of the big goals of like a lot of the work that we're work that we're doing is to, is to enable that, make, make systems more composable, make things more modular so that the users, the, the customers, the users, users are customers and vice versa that there's more freedom of choice and if a component isn't working that well and something better comes along that the switching cost isn't nearly so so high and so for me like you know my goal in all this is like you know i want to enable 
kind of a faster and more sustainable, um, you know, um, rate of innovation around, around these technologies. And so from my perspective, like, you know, I think fragmentation, like fragmentation and like artificial kind of non-composability in these systems, like has created a lot of waste and wasted time and, and wasted efficiency in, in analytical computing. And so if we can give users more choice, choice in programming languages, being able to, you know, swap out components in the stack more easily, uh, upgrade them, you know, with new superchargers as they come along. Um, then, uh, you know, things will get a lot more productive and more efficient and analytics engineers will enjoy their careers more ultimately. Wes, thanks so much for joining us. This has been a lot of fun and, uh, a moment where I get to meet somebody I've been waiting to hang out for the, with for a long time. Where can folks learn more about you and the work that you're doing? We had a, a conference called the, the data thread earlier this year. And there's like a whole bunch of talks from that that you can look and see different applications of Arrow and the Arrow ecosystem. And so there's like great, great set of videos from some of our engineers, as well as like folks in the Arrow community. Uh, we are hosting another uh, edition of the data thread in February. I mean, I'll get in trouble if I quote the wrong date. I'm pretty, <laughs> sure it's fe- pretty sure it's February. So I think we're going to have another great round of talks and content. And uh, I think as time passes and the Aero ecosystem gets bigger and more diverse, then, you know, we learn about like new and, and you know, exciting, uh, exciting use cases, things that our people are building. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's one of those cases where like the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And so I, uh, you know, we're excited to get the good news out and for, for to cross pollinate across, you know, kind of the early adopters and their experiences, you know, as we build towards like this more, uh, this more modular and, and composable future for, for the ecosystem. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks for having me. The Analytics Engineering Podcast is sponsored by DBT Labs and is hosted by Tristan Handy and myself, Julia Schottenstein. Have comments, questions, or guest suggestions? Email us at podcast at dbtlabs.com. Our producers are Jeff Fox and David Krevit. If you enjoy the show, please drop a review or share it with a friend. Thanks for listening.